I think we have to start. We are already two minutes past the start time. So first, hello to everyone uh, and thanks for joining this event. My name is Nancy. I'm a software engineer in Meta. Uh, I focus on ads ranking area. Uh, today I'm going to talk about evaluation of ranking algorithm performance. Um, ranking algorithms are used to rank items in a data set according to some predetermined criteria. And their goal is to serve the right ad or any other type of content to the right user at the right time, which is selected from millions of items on the platform at any time. And this talk will take around 30 minutes. And there will be no QA session for this talk, but please feel free to send me emails or messages if you have any further questions. Um, I am more than happy to answer as much as I can. Um, so as, let's get started. Um, so ranking engineers uh, typically will keep iterating different models with different strategies to achieve the best performance. However, because there are so many of these algorithms, um, they can they have to determine which one works best and should eventually be used. It is especially relevant given the growing concern about the appropriate evaluation of recommendation algorithms and to validate whether there's any performance improvement, it is critical to understand how ranking algorithms can be reliably evaluated and thoroughly verified. Um, this is where offline and online evaluation come into play. Offline evaluation is the most common and simple method of conducting performance evaluation. Um, by saying offline, we mean that we should be able to gather some insights on how this model or strategy would work if it were deployed in an online environment using some methods. And online evaluation measures what a user experiences. For example, the, the quality of interleaved lists that the user interacts with, uh, this directly reflects how attractive the content is to the users. So offline evaluation measures how the current best ranker would perform on the holdout data set. And let's start with talking about offline evaluation methods. Um, since offline evaluation doesn't require online resources, it is more convenient and scalable than online evaluations. Um, consider the most common methods of offline evaluation. Um, data is collected from the live system um, that we want to simulate in order to perform offline evaluation. Uh, if the data is not easily accessible, we can either use publicly available data sets or offline evaluation uh, or build a very basic system to collect live data. So in general, the data set, it's eventually divided into training data and evaluation data, with evaluation data only used for um, performance measurement, but not for training offline evaluation environment. And this split is commonly carried out in three different ways. Um, the first one is, is holdout. So holdout, will split the original data set into training data set and evaluation data set in a random way. So for example, if a recommendation model, um, we can randomly pick 70% of the data out of the original data set we have and make this the training data set. The remaining 30% of the data will be treated as the evaluation data set for model performance evaluation. However, the, the drawback is also obvious for holdout method. The metric we got in the end is closely related to how we split training and evaluation data. If we only do holdout experiment once, um, randomness will dominate our result. And to overcome this, people come up with cross-validation um, cross validation it's a, it's a technique that aims to minimize this risk 
while also providing a simple and accurate model uh, performance evaluation process. Um, they are usually two different types of cross-validation, uh, K-fold cross-validation and leave one out cross-validation. K-fold cross-validation means that we first split the original data set into K different subsets where each of them has the same number of data points and we traverse this K different data sets. And every time we use the current case data set as the evaluation data and all the other remaining data sets uh, as training data to conduct model training and evaluation. And in the end, we will have K different performance metrics through this procedure. The average of this K different performance readings will be the final result. And leave one out cross validation, it's just a, a special case of K fold cross validation. And each time, only one sample is kept as evaluation data. All the other samples are used for training. So, in summary, um, instead of doing one single train and evaluation data split that holdout method does, cross validation conduct multiple times split uh, to eliminate the possible randomness in the result that could be brought by a data set split. However, um, no matter uh, holdout or cross validation, we need to take some samples apart from evaluation. Um, this is not ideal if the if the whole data set is already very small, since this further decreases the number of samples we could use for training. And to resolve this issue, uh, people come up with bootstrap. So what is bootstrap exactly? Um, for a data set that has n samples, we can conduct n times random sampling with with replacements which gives us a training data set with size n. And during the sampling process, some data points will be sampled multiple times. However, some other data points uh, could never get picked. And data points that are not picked will be used as the evaluation data set in the end. Now we have discussed how to conduct uh, offline evaluations. Uh, let's talk a little bit more on what could be the metrics used in offline evaluations. But before we dive into the detailed metrics, let's spend some time to explain a little bit more on what are the things that recommendation models are trying to estimate here. Uh, usually, there are two different types of things we want to model with the recommendation system. The first one is a binary classification problem, which just indicates whether a user will view or purchase or take any other action with the ad shown. Um, the second one is a regression problem, which tries to model how much time or how much money the user will spend on the ad that is going to be shown to them. We use different metrics to evaluate classification models and regression models. For classification, people tend to use log loss, accuracy, precision, and recall. And for regression, uh, RMSE and MAP are commonly used. And let's go through the mentioned metrics one by one now. The first one is log loss. Um, log loss is just the loss function for logistic regression, which is commonly used for binary classification problem. And a lot of deep learning models uh, will also use logistic regression as the output layer for binary classification problems. Uh, log loss is also well known as cross entropy. Uh, what is measured by cross entropy is the gap between two probability distributions. But in our case, um, so in our case, we are using cross entropy to measure the gap between the ground truth label distribution um, and the predicted conversion rate distribution, which means that the smaller the cross entropy is, 
the more accurate the recommendation result is. As a result, using log loss as the evaluation metrics can directly reflect the change in model loss function. If we only think about this from the model training perspective, log loss is also um, a good metric to judge um, whether the model uh, has converged or not. Um, before we dive into uh, other remaining metrics for binary classification problems, um, <laughs> let's do a brief introduction to confusion metrics first. Um, because most of the metrics are built up based on the elements in this confusion matrix. In the binary classification problem, we only have uh, two different categories, positive and negative. For positives, two scenarios could happen. So model uh, predicts them as positives correctly or wrongly predicts them as negatives. <laughs> For positives that are correctly classified as positive samples, they are called true positives. And for positives that are wrongly classified as negative samples, they are called false negatives. And similarly for negative samples, if they are correctly classified as negatives, then they are true negatives, otherwise false positives. With the true label, and the predicted label of a sample, we can divide the samples into four different categories, true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. With the knowledge of confusion matrix, let's see how different metrics for binary classification are, are derived with the help from this confusion matrix. So the first metric we are going to have a look at is accuracy. Um, accuracy means that the percentage of the data points that are correctly classified, uh, which means that the numerator is the summation of samples that are predicted to the right class, no matter the, the, the right class is positive or negative and the, new the denominator is all samples. Um, accuracy, it's a, it's a very straightforward metric for classification problems. Um, even though accuracy is very intuitive, uh, it also has a very obvious drawback. So when the data set is very imbalanced, the accuracy result is mostly impacted by the dominant class. So for example, if the, if the negative samples take up to 99% of the data, then if the classifier predicts every single data point to be negative, the model can still have a 99% accuracy. So to get a whole picture, uh, to get the whole picture of how the classifier performs, people will also uh, look at precision recall and F1 score. Um, precision is the percentage of true positives in the samples that are considered as positives by the, by the classifier. The, the numerator here is the samples with positives as true label and also predicted as positives. Um, the denominator here is all the samples that are predicted as positives, which means that some of them are actually negatives. And recall is the, is the percentage of true positives in all of the positive samples. The numerator here is still the samples with positive as true label and also predicted as positives. However, the denominator here, uh, it's all the samples that was positive as the true label, which means that some of them are actually predicted as negatives wrongly. So usually uh, we need to balance these two different metrics um, because to improve precision, the classifier need to mark the sample as positive when it is very confident. However, 
being too conservative could end up with low recall since uh, low confidence positives are filtered out. To use one single metric to reflect precision and recall, we can leverage F1 score. F1 score combines precision and recall together and gives a more comprehensive idea on how the classifier performs. Um, to evaluate regression models, uh, RMSE and MAPE are, are commonly used. RMSE is the root mean square error. Um, it is a very common metric to evaluate the performance uh, for a regression model. So usually RMSE can reflect the deviation between the model predictions and the true labels. However, in the, in the actual implementation, if there are some outliers, RMSE could show a very bad value, even though they are only several outliers. And to resolve this, we can use MAPE, which is mean absolute percent error, which is supposed to be more robust to outliers. Um, compared to RMSE, MAPE does a normalization uh, for the error from each data point so that outliers won't influence the result too much with the absolute error it has. Uh, so you may ask why we still need to do online evaluations if we can do everything in offline. Um, it is because no matter how delicately we design the offline experiments, they will never be able to fully replicate the online environments um, because a model uh, because a model performs well in offline testing and metrics does not guarantee that it will produce the business benefits that are important to the company. The, the problem arises because offline tests cannot determine causality. Mm, so first, in an offline setup, we cannot simulate online feature serving or model snapshot updates. And the second reason is that we cannot assess performance using online metrics such as click-through rate or conversion rate. So here comes the, the question, so how, how to conduct online experiments? Um, A-B test is the strategy we use. As an example, so suppose the, the data science team has a new ranking algorithm ready for deployment. Offline tests validated it on historical data, but we don't know if this model will improve certain metrics. And to validate the original hypothesis that better recommendations improve engagement, a randomized controlled experiment, uh, which is also known as AP test, must be conducted. When deploying machine learning models, running AB tests requires additional code and infrastructure for configuring experiments and routing requests to the to the appropriate models. Mm, let's talk about more details about the A-B test setup. Um, so in the A-B test, we usually have one control version and one test version, uh, and one single different configuration is tested between, between these two versions to help draw the conclusion whether this new change is helpful or not. Let's use an example to illustrate how this works in the recommendation area. So first, we split the users randomly into two buckets, one, of the, one for control and one for test. So for the control version, we use the existing ranking model we have. But for the test version, we use the new model we want to test to give the recommendation results. By comparing metrics between these two versions, we should be able to tell how well the, the new model performs. The most important thing when splitting the users is that 
we have to make sure that uh, every sample is independent from each other. And assignment to different buckets is fully random. In other words, every user can only be assigned to the same bucket during the test running. And the user ID that is used for uh, bucket assignment should be a random number so that there's no bias between these two versions. And in the real A-B test environment, every website or app uh, might need to test several different types of things at the same time. So for example, the front end team might want to test different UI interfaces for the app. And the product team might want to test different formats of the ads. And the ranking team might want to test different ranking strategies. If we don't design the, the experiments carefully, these three different tests will interfere with each other. And as a result, we won't be able to read anything trustworthy from this test. To avoid this, the, the following rules need to be enforced when conducting A-B tests. Uh, the first rule is for the tests that are experimenting uh, with different components. Um, for example, uh, UI versus models. The traffic between these tests needs to be orthogonal. Let's say we have one UI experiment with 500 users in the control version and 500 users in the test version and one modeling experiment with 500 users in the control version and 500 users in the test version as well. To not have these two experiments interfere with each other, we have to make sure that for the 500 users in both versions of the, of the modeling experiment, 250 of them should see the new UI and the other 250 users should see the old UI. And same for the UI experiment, um, 250 users should see the recommendation results um, from the new models for both versions and the other 250 users should see the recommendation results from the old models. The second rule is that uh, for the tests that are experimenting with the same component, the traffic from each test needs to be mu mutually exclusive. Um, for, for example, if we have five different experiments that are testing different ranking models, mm, there should be no overlapped users between these tests. In other words, one user should only see the recommendation results from one of the tested models during the whole process of the experiments. Um, how can we evaluate performance in online experiments then? The biggest reason why we have to run um, online experiments before launching anything, anything new is because we can read business related metrics only in online setup. And here are some uh, commonly used online metrics. So CTR and CTR are click through rate and conversion rate, which means that uh, what is the percentage of users who click the ads or actually buy something from, an ad, from the ads after seeing an impression from, from this ads. And CPM, CPC, and CPA describe how efficiently the budget from advertisers are consumed. CPM here is, is cost per thousand impressions, and CPC here is cost per click, and CPA here is cost per action, where action here could be upper funnel events like view content or mid funnel events like add to cart or deep funnel events like purchase. And AOV and ROAS here describe the, the ROI for advertisers by running these ads. AOV here means um, average order value and ROAS here uh, means return of ad spend. To summarize what we have covered today, 
Um, delivering business value through machine learning requires thorough evaluations and and ongoing monitoring of machine learning models throughout their lifetime. On the other hand, um, offline experimentation enables rapid iteration um, through various solutions to a different problem. This can be very different or dozens of minor variations. Uh, it is both faster and less expensive than A-B testing and it frequently provides more information. But on the other hand, online experimentation is carried out on real time or online data, allowing for the representation of uh, real life situations and more precise evaluation. Uh, in this regard, online experiments may be the best way to, to evaluate different changes and determine whether a particular action leads to the desired outcomes. Um, still to maintain, to maintain, uh, to obtain consistent results, um, online experiments must be run for um, several days or even weeks to get stable readings. So this means because of limited online resources and the fact that untested changes may harm user experience, the common practice is to use offline experiments to quickly iterate different optimizations until an appropriate option is identified and then run online experiments for launch decisions. And this is all for the content I have today. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining. And I do see some uh, messages from the chat and Q&A. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot answer the questions here because of the NDA ag agreement I have with the company, but I have my email here. So please feel free to send me emails or messages. I am very happy to answer as much as I can. And thanks all for, for today. And thanks again, everyone. And hope everyone enjoy the rest of the day.